On December 31st, 1983, as Nigerians gathered at various prayer locations to pray to God, to make the new year 1984 a better year than 1983, they had no clue that Buhari and his co-conspirators were on the verge of deposing President Sheikh Shagari-led government, a duly elected civilian administration. This ushered in the General Muhammad Buhari-led military administration. Twenty months later, precisely on August 27, 1985, Buhari was overthrown in a palace coup believed to be the most bloodless coup in Nigeria and was then detained in Benin City until 1988. But was this coup really bloodless? In this video, we will explain in detail why Ibrahim Badamusi Babangida overthrew Buhari in the 1985 palace coup. Hello, 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 his blast. Welcome back to another video. Gabriel here. Before we go on, Please take a moment to smash the like button on this video so that others can see it as well. Don't forget to subscribe to Ispool Media. Subscription is free. Just hit the red button down below. Thank you. In the months leading to the August coup, Nigerians were already accustomed to hearing routine reports about one politician or the other being sentenced to prison, generally for 21 years or more, or even in parallel sentences. In the midst of it all, familiar news headlines of people being imprisoned for written and publishing obnoxious articles would appear every now and then. After undertaking official state visits to many states in Nigeria, General Buhari took a public two-week vacation in early August and returned to his hometown, Daura. Shortly after Buhari returned to Lagos, his chief of staff, Major General Idiagbon, accompanied by some senior officials including Major General M.J. Vatsa, the then Minister for the Federal Capital Territory, were on their way to Mecca for pilgrimage. At this time, the hand of faith was beckoning. The decision to proceed with a large-scale reduction in the size of the army in order to reduce defense expenditures created tension in the barracks. However, as the dictatorship was moving in this direction in order to free up strategic resources for higher social expenditure while also dealing with IMF constraints, Major General Ibrahim Babangida remarked in a public speech that those who favor reduced defense spending cannot win. The erstwhile head of state, General Muhammad Buhari, and his deputy, Major General Tunde Idiagmo, were accused of dictatorial lack of consultation with their military colleagues. Grog's abuse of human rights is amplified by mass detention of politicians and others without due process, proscription of professional organizations, muzzling of the press, and promulgation of retroactive laws. To this was added insensitivity to respected leaders of thought in various parts of Nigeria, the issue of counter trade and alleged intent to take the IMF loan against popular wishes was also an issue of contention. Buhari was also accused of not distributing positions to junior officers. Another reason was attributed to displeasure on the part of Chief MKO Abiola, who was alleged to have helped finance the 1983 coup that brought Buhari into power. Abiola was upset not only with the decision of the Buhari regime to seize and auction a large consignment of his newsprint, which had allegedly been smuggled into the country but also with an inquiry into the possible role of a relative in drug trade. However, in an interview in Kaduna on March 28, 2002, Buhari claimed that Babangida staged a coup because he was afraid his anti-corruption war would catch up with him since his confidant Aliu Muhammad was already forced to retire due to corruption. Indeed, a supposed military takeover was rumored at least once before August 27 and was then said to have been postponed. A well-placed defense attache in Lagos was overheard wandering in a chat. Apart from Idiabo, who is on his side, he was alluding to Buari as one might suspect. As far back as March 1985, rumors of military coup began to spread not only among the diplomatic communities but on the streets as well. For instance, there were rumors on the streets that Ibrahim Babangida and Buhari were not seen eyeball to eyeball. However, not all the rumors were intended. Mr. Alex Ibru, a leading businessman, met with General Diagbon in his home, accompanied by Lieutenant Colonel M.C. Ali to discuss the rumors. 
but the Jaguar decided to display a calm demeanor, downplaying the risk and falsely telling Ibru that everything was under control. On yet another occasion, Lieutenant Colonel MC Ali heard rumors from other sources that the coup was in the offing. However, like many Nigerian rulers before him, Ejiagwon blew off the warning, saying, let them try. Unconfirmed reports claim that Major General MJ Vatsa also made discreet effort to warn both Buhari and Ejiagwon about rumors of a coup led by Ibrahim Babangida. Some writers like to describe the August 27th Palace coup as an unusually brilliant operation having pre-positioned selected officers in strategic unit since early 1984. It was not too difficult to formulate a plan for the coup de grace against Buhari. The plan was driven by the capabilities offered by penetration of key units, either for full mobilization or passive neutralization, added to a large extent by the authority structure and prerogatives of the Office of the Chief of Army Staff. In other words, the means were in place and the motive had been fine-tuned. What was left was the opportunity. According to several accounts, planning took place in Lagos, Mina and London. The military governor Lieutenant Colonel David Mark allegedly supplied cover, guest rooms and other resources for such activities in Mina, the capital of the Chief of Army Staff's home state and the main center for the conspiracy. Lieutenant Colonel Olurin, the local brigade commander, was obviously not in the dark. According to some account, a small group of plotters and enablers shuttled in and out of London, mainly around a certain apartment in Kensington. And finally in July, General Babangida was believed to have tidied up loose ends while on a statewide tour of military installations. It has already been shown that funding for the August 1985 plot was donated by some citizens. However, that is not all. A knowledgeable source has proposed another technique to explain how money was moved through the commander of a crucial armored unit in Lagos for miscellaneous items, recruitment and pacification. The corps headquarters allegedly altered the budget proposal for a new officer's mess, several multiples over what was required, knowing that the difference would be accessible in an operational impress account for criminal conduct. The basic operational concept was to isolate and arrest the head of state as soon as possible, cut him off from the chain of command, neutralize likely sympathetic resistance and occupy vulnerable points such as radio and television stations telephone exchange, police signals installations, airfields, and civilian administrative establishments. As alluded to earlier, General Buari initially traveled to Daura for the Sala break, but then returned to Lagos right into the tiger's jaw. Although he had its stained image among civilians, the chief of staff, Major General Tunde Idiagbo, had gone from a staff position as military secretary between 1981 to 1983 to that of the Chief of Staff, Supreme Headquarters. It has been a long time since he had directly commanded troops, even before his tour as military secretary. As a result, he lacked a recent command link or viceroyal connection to any credible body of men with which he might combat the plotters. Idiagbo, on the other hand, had gone on a pilgrimage outside the country and was therefore one less significant target to worry about. According to reports, he was escorted by Chief MKO Abiola, who was allegedly well aware of the plot and may have gone along for the pilgrimage as a form of deception and a source of intelligence. Generals Nasarawa and Vatsa are said to have been other notable military officers among the delegation. There was certainly no sympathy from any quarters. The Buhari regime could not expect any sympathy from Britain after all the flap about Umaru Diko and withdrawal of ambassadors. Do you think the coup would have been so easy if Idiagbon was in the country? Please leave a comment in the comment section. Other officers considered potentially hostile were to be arrested very early by key conspirators using different types of subterfuge at just after hash hour. As always, the question of political and military timing was crucial. 
at around the same time, an elaborate military exercise was staged, allowing the build-up of many armored personnel carriers and armored fighting vehicles at the Ikeja barracks, which had been on standby for nearly a week before Babangida struck. Although the revolution occurred in the early hours of 27th, much of the final mobilization took place in the morning between 8 and 9 a.m., immediately before the Muslim festival of Eid al kabaya on August 26, 1985. Being Salah day, it would theoretically be least expected and alertness would not be at its peak. This gave room for the cool plotters to have a free access, and then at the hash hour, they struck. We will look at this in more detail in the next video, which will be part 2 of this video. Please subscribe and enable notification so you don't miss the part 2 where we are going to cover how Buari was removed in a systematically brilliant coup. Like this video if you have value from it. Leave a comment or suggestion below. Thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video. Peace.